We have a great lineup of folks who are going to be here tonight, including Dr. Mark Summers. And we've got three uh, partners from the local media. So we have Kelly from Unmonumental and With Good Reason. We have David, they're all kind of back <laughs> by our video. David from RVA Mag. And James from the Richmond Times Dispatch. So we're going to hear from them a little bit more in the second half of our program, exploring these connections between the past and the present. So our panelists will ask questions of each other, but also at that point is when we'll open it up to you all to be able to have that kind of back and forth with our panelists too. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I've been at the Richmond Times Dispatch for 12 years. It's my second major newspaper that I worked at. I, I think the good professor here mentioned that I worked at the uh, Louisville Courier Journal also before coming here. Um, I also uh, worked for the U.S. Navy at their Audiovisual Command and also as an editor at their uh, Pacific Fleet uh, News Feature Service. Um, I'm primarily responsible for all what we call the visual report of the newspaper. But it's not just the newspaper anymore. We also on the website, richmond.com. So anything visual related is my responsibility, whether that's uh, video, slideshows, uh, wire photos that go into the uh, A section of the paper or the, the international section and the national section of the paper as well as the local content. And uh, I'm David. I'm the editor of the print magazine of RBA Mag. Uh, it's been around for 13, 13, I think this is our 13th year. I've been there for much shorter time. I'm new to Richmond. I've only been here for about two years. I've written some books on cycling, uh, report for other online outlets, and um, yeah, I'm just enjoying being here. And um, I'm Kelly Libby. I'm a public media producer. I've spent eight years working in public radio, mostly at the show With Good Reason, um, which is a program of the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities in Charlottesville, and it airs statewide, but also in 34 other states and in Germany. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we interview professors from the public colleges and universities in Virginia, and so um, in that way we kind of amplify the, the, the amazing talent and research that comes out of the public university system here in the state of Virginia. And I'm also the creator and producer of uh, a, a weekly segment called Unmonumental, which is not airing now, but did in um, 2016. And it features the voices of people who live in Richmond telling their own memories of this city. So it was a, a short segment, sort of like StoryCorps, if anybody's heard that, that um, aired on Fridays for a period of time. So thinking about the presentation tonight and just the topic about partisan press, do you have, did you hear anything in Dr. Summers' talk that really resonated with you three as journalists today? Well, he, he did mention bias as one of the stories, and I think that's one of the things that a lot of people really pin on the mainstream media now anyway. And I know this is called mainstream media, and some will call it the, the liberal mainstream media. It just depends on what your perspective is. Or, or, the, or the lamestream yeah, media. Yeah, the lamestream the also. <laughs> but I, I think compared to the Civil War area and now, I think newspapers may be fundamentally different. I'm not saying that bias doesn't exist because I, I think it really does. But I, I need to really clarify that point also because I think I'm an older black gentleman. My history and my background is different from David's, which is different from Kelly's. So we bring something to the table that what makes our contributions valuable, but it can also get in the way sometimes of a story. And one of the things I think is important when you look at a story is what the facts are in related to that story. I think a 
150, 160 years ago, it was really difficult because news didn't travel at the speed that it travels now. I think if the president tweets something now, we all know about it immediately almost. And it's the same thing if a journalist makes news because they wrote something about a story that wasn't true and that news is out there and it's discredited almost immediately. So. I don't think bias is necessarily a bad thing. I think it depends on the scope and quality of the editing of a story in terms of how factual it is and if that's a source that you know you can depend on for providing the facts that you're looking for in a story. If you really have no trust in that organization to begin with, it really is pretty certain that you're not going to believe a lot of what you read from them anyway. And I think too, uh, we all have biases in life. You know, I, I think kind of the thing that a lot of people don't realize about news though is even we're a pretty scrappy outlet, RVA Mag, we're smaller than the dispatcher, a lot of the other locals, but even for us, our stories are touched by three or four people whenever they go out. You know, there's a writer, there's at least one editor, oftentimes two. And, uh, and then another writer may also help the first writer get their piece out there. So you have a lot of chances to kind of check your biases and make sure that, you're, that they're not carrying through and that what you're really writing about is what's accurate and true. And I, I think there's one other thing also. There is a really clear distinction between the regular news coverage and editorial content of most major newspapers. Often you really don't find them mixing at all. But in my experience is a lot of people are really confused by that in terms of what you're getting and, and what the bent is. Um, at the Courier Journal, it was a family-owned paper. Richmond was another family-owned paper. So we were just talking about biases. What about the bias and the leanings of the people who own those papers? Do they have an agenda? Is there something they are trying to really get across and communicate more so? Do they have an argument? Do the Bryans here in town hate the Binghams in Louisville so they want to counter what they're saying? Because they were on kind of different political spectrums. One's more conservative, one's very left-leaning. So if you really can't make the distinction between the editorial content and the news content, then it all gets really confusing. But for us, our editorial department is two floors away. Um, they don't mingle with us at all. What they write about in their perspective is not tied to the news at all. We try to really make sure, as David was saying, that you go through that process in terms of gathering the facts, checking those facts, and making sure it's balanced before you present it. In public media, um, which was established actually this year, um, it, would, it will be 50 years that public media has been here was with the establishment of the um, uh, Public Broadcasting Act. And what public media strives to do is to represent the public um, and to be responsive to the public, but then to also um, take creative risks and um, um, you know, provide education to the public too, um, which kind of it brings up a question for me. And I wondered if in the 1860s were there places, were there media outlets where there was where they claimed to be, you know, in service to the the public? Is this you know was there um, sure. media for Americans? Oh sure. Uh, there's any, any number of newspapers will tell you that they are really very independent and that they are speaking for the public in general. That's why they have names like Tribune, for example, or the Argus, as in the Argus Eyed or such, or the Expositor or such. But in point of fact, that independence in most cases 
Unless you're a big, really fancy, really rich press, you know, it's above your price range to be able to afford to actually be independent. But you can say it with no difficulty at all. You know, uh, but it's, after the Civil War, that begins to change. You begin to have newspapers that are proud of the fact that they don't follow the party line that they're beginning to make their own line in one direction or another. And by 1872, a few of those biggest newspapers actually are about to uh, run their own candidate for president, really, who is not either a Republican or a Democrat, and they're hoping one party or the other will support him. Well, I don't have to tell you that the, uh, that the candidate that they actually run is actually a newspaper editor, uh, and it's in fact Horace Greeley. And I might add that these independent editors are more horrified than anybody else that he actually got as far as being nominated. What makes that really bad? Well, let's start out with the very fact that Horace Greeley was a man with very intense opinions. At one point he said, and was long remembered for having said, while it is true that not every Democrat is a horse thief, every horse thief is a Democrat. And who nominated him for president in 1872? The horse, uh, the, the Democrat. That's who. It shouldn't be too surprising that by the end of the campaign, Horace Greeley was being pilloried for 40 years of the things he'd said. He, he complained that he didn't know whether he was running for the presidency or the penitentiary, and he was so humiliated by people <laughs> quoting back his own statements to himself that within a, within a month of his landslide victory, he went crazy, was put in an asylum, and died. Not a very good ending for this rather remarkable man. But they're going to talk. It, it's not till after the Civil War that you actually begin to find real, genuine, independent papers because they could afford it because they've got advertisements in the cities from department stores and elsewhere, because they've got subscription lists based on their news gathering abilities, they don't have to be beholden to a party. But before the war, if they say they're independent, it basically means they're going to dodge all the issues. It's not going to mean that they're going to try to balance between them. It's just not there. And the other thing is the point that was made about the difference between, that you made, the, the difference between the editorial page and the front page. We often forget how late that division actually comes. Uh, I'll give you, I used one example before you folks were here, and I'll use it again, the Chicago Tribune. All the way up through the 1930s and 40s, the Chicago Tribune is one of the most virulent uh, you know, mad dog, reactionary Republican papers in the country. It is very opinionated in every way. In 1936, when FDR is running for re-election, the switchboard operators of the Chicago Tribune are ordered to open up with, Good morning, Chicago Tribune. Are you aware you only have 57 days left to save your country? That's the way it is. And throughout the entire campaign, and again, this comes back to what you were talking about with pictures. They made sure that FDR's photograph, no matter what the event, never appeared on the front page at all. So that people might kind of forget that he was running. Well, since he carried all but two states, I'd have to say it didn't really work very well, but, but you, know, you get the idea. And the other example of this, of how this kind of stuff is so recent, I don't even have to go to the William Randolph Hearst papers. I can say that, say, in, 18, in 1900, in 1920, you know how you can tell which newspaper is which, say, in Cleveland or Cincinnati? They put their, ad, they put their political cartoon on the front page. So it's the first thing you see when you see the paper. In point of fact, their opinions and their judgment are the number one thing that you're noticing them for. And the news is sort of a secondary option. And, and that's, that's in the 20th century. And the Chicago Tribune kept on doing that all the way up until about 1970. Which again tells you, it's kind, a lot of this is kind of recent. Right. Well, I have a question about format too, and mm -hmm. and and for you. And I mentioned StoryCorps, which has two people who know each other or have some kind of connection, interview each other, and it, it and it's sort of egalitarian. And that's the kind of work I do too, where we're just we're amplifying the work of professors, or I'm amplifying the voices of people who live in Richmond. Are there? And, and, and you're a photographer, and I don't know if um, if your magazine also has these kind of like features. Mm -hmm. um, and 
is that a, a sort of less bias? Is there still bias there in, in that kind of putting forward of stories? And are those kinds of stories helpful to a democracy? Or, you know. I, I would say there's absolutely still bias. So uh, currently I'm working on a series on homelessness in Richmond. And I would say, you know, I definitely have a bias there in, in selecting and working on that. That I think it's an important issue. I think people care about it. I think people who don't care about it need to hear more about it and care about it. Uh, so there's, a, to, to, I, I think that kind of answers that question, at least from my perspective, that I, I feel like as long as the bias is something that I could defend in a room of people or in writing or with facts or details, it's uh, maybe an acceptable bias. As opposed to, uh, so my, my, big, my big example would be political bias. Let's say that a certain president did everything I ever wanted and I still wrote an article, he's a terrible man. To me, that would be an unacceptable bias that you are just so predisposed to not accept this person no matter what they do. Whereas a, maybe an acceptable bias would be a set of core values that you feel strongly about, that you still are checking in with your editor and colleagues and making sure you're not distorting facts, you're still telling a true story. With larger papers, there's a bit of a breakdown in terms of how stories are created, if that makes any sense, because a lot of reporters have what's known as beats, which is this is the thing that they cover, uh, whether it's City Hall or Richmond Public Schools or they're covering politics at the state capitol. Um, then there are general assignment reporters who really have a lot more leeway to really discover and present stories that not necessarily are tied to a specific thing, so they can really branch out a little more. And I think, I'm, I'm not necessarily certain it's a bias that leads you to a story. I think it's your interest in the things that uh, you find compelling versus it more or less being a bias in one way or another. Um, photographers, almost at any paper other than the very largest papers like the Washington Post and the New York Times, photographers are probably the only person working at the paper that covers everything. And I do mean everything. You have to cover politics, you have to cover sports, you have to go to City Hall. Um, so photographers like to think they don't really have these biases. So um, that's one of the main differences, I think, than when you're really working maybe at a smaller organization, this differentiation of responsibilities at the paper and who does what. Um, but really, there's uh, the gatekeeper is usually the editor for this person anyway. You really have to sell that story to be able to get it in the paper. Um, very seldom can a reporter or a photographer that matter go, yeah, I created this, run it in the paper. That's not going to happen. Um, how relevant is it as a photo or as a story? Um, we really do try to make a difference in the information that we're presenting, is it useful or not? But Sometimes I can understand why people feel like there may be a particular bias. Um, why is a kid with cancer a more important story maybe than an adult with some other disease or illness that we may run three stories of this kid? Um, maybe it's the emotional value of that story or something else that I think where maybe the bias could necessarily come in because you think everybody's sympathetic to the kids with the big eyes and you know. So if you have an agenda that's more <laughs> likely to move that agenda along versus that's just an older person, we see that face all the time, it's an adult, they can deal with their illness, you know, that type of thing. So I think if there are any biases in, in the way I think larger papers, particularly our paper, approach a story, it's those types, not necessarily something you set out to, to present all along. I'm going to ask one more question of the panel before we open it up to the audience. 
Uh, Dr. Summers, I'm curious, since we've kind of heard some parallels of things that we viewed from the present looking back or things we were curious on about the Civil War era, but as somebody who's steeped in that 19th century history, when you look out in your world today, what parallels or connections do you see? Well, I, in fact, what we have is we don't have as many newspapers in any town, but we've got an awful lot of competing medias. Uh, you can go to a website and you can find the news that suits your purpose the most and you can never escape from that bubble. And you can be persuaded that uh, the other side is frightening, demonic, uh, declaring war on Christmas, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what, what, whatever kind of hideous sorts of thoughts are out there. <laughs> and never actually pay attention to stuff that comes in, say, the mainstream media or in a media that you don't happen to agree with. People look at stuff that reinforce their own biases and it's much easier to do it now than when the main source of news was newspapers. Uh, it's so much easier to really create your own niche that way. And so I see, I see that polarization as very, very dangerous. I see it as dangerous at the time of the Civil War. I think it brought us closer to violent conflict than it might. And I think it's something that has the same kind of capacity for creating maybe not a violence that's going to kill 750,000 people, but a violence out there in American society that is really quite frightening when in fact you have people that know exactly what their competing truth is and they do not want to hear anything else. Now I, 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 I can see real parallels from back then and I find many of the parallels pretty frightening. Did uh, our industry try to correct itself after the Civil War? Uh, the industry, some of the industry did correct itself but in fact Partisan papers continue to exist. What, what did change was that that kind of umbilical cord between party newspapers and government uh, agencies providing with contracts was pretty much done away with. Uh, you no longer are subsidizing an administration newspaper in Washington, D.C. that prints exactly what the administration wants and nothing else. Uh, you've got a government printing office instead that does the printing at cost out there rather than raking this stuff off. And in any number of cities and towns, you're going to find the same thing. Those printing contracts don't make the same kind of difference. And one of the reasons is because the big, I think, the big city newspapers are doing such a terrific job of news that for any number of smaller town newspapers, you can't afford to get by on patronage anymore. You've got to give more news. Patronage will allow you to survive. It's not going to make you rich. You've got to go in for news gathering if you want to actually collect more of an audience. And in fact, as in Cincinnati or Louisville or elsewhere, you have advertisers out there who are trying to sell their goods in the market. Uh, you know, I guess Macy's, Strawbridge and Clothier, uh, you know, whatever else they are. Uh, grocery stores, A and P. They don't want, they don't want to advertise in, in a, a paper that only appeals to one part of the public market. They want something that everybody reads. And that means that the newspapers, if they want to keep getting those ads, they're going to have to shift their politics more directly to the editorial page and not put them elsewhere. But it's going to take about 30 years for that to happen. It's going to take a long time for that kind of shift to happen. I think we have something similar to some of that going on today too though. I would say uh -huh. when I look at our coverage that really landed or the last year, it was anything with a voice, anything that kind of kind of staked down opinion, one based in accuracy and truth and fact that we didn't set out to, to prove. Mm -hmm. But certainly it was the things with a, a little bit of a voice and a little bit of an opinion and mm -hmm. and that were news and reporting gathering things instead of mm -hmm. retelling stories or right kind of copying others. Yeah, it does link. Uh, you other guys, how do you feel about that? <laughs> about what? Uh, the, 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 what we've just been describing here of this sort of shift that, it, that, that, that we're seeing happening mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the news to try to appeal more broadly and in fact the problem of narrowness out there that we were talking about. 
And, and I'd say too, just in general, the, the idea that things that have a voice and, That's right. mm -hmm. and kind of personality that carry through, or, or, which I would say is most of your, all of your work really, right? All of your work seeks to capture characters and voice. Yeah, yeah. And also I was on, on the way over here, I was talking to my dad on the phone and he was telling me that in the 1960s, I'm from near Jacksonville, Florida, and he was telling me there was a whole lot of corruption in the city in the 60s and that CBS, knew, the local CBS affiliate had reporters who were dedicated to to um, exposing this corruption mm -hmm. and that you know if you were a business and you were doing something wrong you could be threatened with well we're gonna call Channel 4 News and you're gonna be on the news you know and so it, it seems like that a similar kind of spirit and he said that it actually changed the city for the better mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there's something too that I, I, I feel like we um, local local journalism is so critical, and um, maybe it's hard to have that happening right now for for whatever reasons. But um, I'm just thinking of my first job was at an alt weekly in Jacksonville. And um, that publication too was like full of characters, mm -hmm. with with voices, and um, and we're seeing a decline in these alt weeklies in communities, and that is troubling to me because I think that's the kind of stuff that makes real impact locally, and and local journalism is is really critical. I, I think the professor made a, a really good point in that. Newspapers are driven by advertising, so you keep everything editorial kind of separate. Uh, it's a different kind of problem because then you really have to be concerned about who your advertisers are. And if you're writing something that really offends or upset those people. Um, I do remember from Louisville, we, we wrote a pretty significant story that the auto dealers didn't like. Mm -hmm. and they pull their ads for one week. Mm -hmm. They knew they needed the newspaper, but they also wanted to send a message. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the page costing between eight and ten thousand dollars, and they were doing ten thousand, ten pages a day, so it's over half a million dollars that they pull from the paper in a week. Now you multiply that by 52, and someone at the top would, would get the message. Um, recently, here at the Times Dispatch, we did a, a pretty long article on Dominion Energy because they're one of the largest influencers in the state. Uh, that story really needed to be done. It needed to be told, and people needed to know what the influence was with Dominion Energy. And I was really kind of proud that we still did that kind of story simply because you hit the light flitch, Dominion has influence and power in your life in some way. Literally. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> in more Pun unintended. <laughs> but, but really, Dominion never really came back at us about that story because it goes back to what we were talking about initially. Are you fact-checking? Are you truthful? Are you fair? And I sat right next to the reporter who wrote that story, and I heard him calling them, like on a daily basis, checking one little thing. And he would go back to his editor, and his editor would have a question, and he'd call him again. He made sure up until the very last minute until we published that story, they had the opportunity to add their voice to the story in some way. They knew what we were writing, and we never heard from Dominion about that story because they knew it was fair, balanced, and accurate. Yeah, it's true, <laughs> but the catch is did that Dominion is also one of a whole bunch of economic interests in, say, Virginia. What happens if you're in a state where your industry is the only game in town? How much reporting is there going to be that's going to reflect badly on it? You go in the 20s or 30s out there and you go to Montana and you try to find anybody that says anything bad about Anaconda, the copper company in Montana, you're not going to do it. There's an absolute lid to shut that stuff down. 
Same thing with the coal company in West Virginia, it has to be said, and probably in eastern Kentucky, too. Uh, so, you know, you're absolutely right about that, and the fact-checking counts. But maybe Dominion also realizes that, at least in Richmond, it's not the only game in town. It doesn't have that absolute power to crush and destroy. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. We all know that. No, I, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. And I, I think Dominion's a, a very smart company uh, in, in those terms, too. I, I think they know that they could really kind of put a bandage on that and really move on. It won't stop their overall objective. I've seen some hands pop up with questions. I'm going to start here in the corner and then we'll go to Ian. Okay. I'm absolutely fascinated by everything you said. Jester, you are a marvel. Oh, thank you. You, you told us about all the ways in which the press has been manipulated, has been um, biased, has contributed to division, Bad potentially bad influences on the Republic. Right now, I don't see my Congress standing up. I don't. I don't see that that branch of government standing up. I don't see. Uh, I don't see the Supreme Court, the executive, the judiciary standing up. And lots of us right now think we are in Never Never Neverland in the twilight zone in this country politically, and we're looking to the court, the state, we're looking to the press to, to save to save to save us. So I'm fascinated by by what you said, but I'm, I'm looking at you to say, gosh, we hope you're going to be our savior. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you, you guys, you're, you're the ones that have to say you're going to be your savior. No. An academic, a, a, a professor of history is not going to be able to save anybody, <laughs> including most of his students, I'm afraid. No, I, I would say make your voice heard. This is what we do is based on a lot on your interests. We're not sitting down in cubicles there, just putting out the paper for the sake of, of putting out the paper. Um, I think you have a, a lot of idealistic people who think they're really doing good. And, and that's really an important point. It's not because they want to get rich, because I don't think anybody at the paper is getting rich. They really believe in what they do and doing it to the best of their ability. But they really need your input also. They need your voice. This is your paper uh, in Richmond. And you have to be as dogged about that as some reporter is when he gets a tip that something's going on that's just not right. And you have to continue to make your voice heard um, to the editors at that paper. It can't just be the CEO of Dominion calling whenever he feels like he wants something and saying, oh, we're doing a charity thing today. Come over and cover this for us. Because that makes them look a lot better. If uh, there are stories, there are tips, uh, on our website, there's a place we have, we call it, we call it um, Customer Tracker. You can tell us any story, any information, anything you want. And uh, trust me, I know that we will follow up. We have 24 hours to do it. That's part of what we do. If you put in one of those tracker tickets, we have 24 hours to follow up on it. You'll hear from someone. And so, so we're a magazine, we have a slightly smaller staff, and we're not always at the breaking news, but it's the same for us. Reach out, you know, we don't, we don't always hear from readers, except in person. What's the best you can ever do is email the ownership or the, editor, the editors of the magazine, and uh, just tell them you really liked some of the coverage. We do a lot of political coverage, and uh, you know, there's always a worry that you could make advertisers nervous with that. I tend to believe advertisers just want to reach a lot of eyeballs, so let, let our advertisers know you read us and email, email the magazine and tell them, you know, we really like your political coverage on something. That's kind of, that's I think the best way to get more of that out there. And there are some folks, um, friends and colleagues, um, people in my industry who are working on ways to engage the public more deeply by, you know, inviting, you know, developing technologies and developing ways to be more in the community to invite your questions and um, story ideas. And so I, I feel pretty hopeful about some of the projects that are coming out in that regard. Hey, uh, let me say one more thing. Yes, um, 
We make all our decisions on our stories that we're going to run in the paper like twice a day, once in the morning, like a preliminary meeting. Then we have an afternoon meeting where we decide what's going in the paper the next day. Our meetings are always open to the public. Anybody can walk in and sit there and listen to what they what we're <laughs> pitching, and you can even pitch your own idea if you want. They're always Maybe open. Let's go. I, I would not have told this room that, but no, very our brave publisher of you. says that all the time. It they're open, and we have people come in all the time. We do. Great. I'm going to go to the question in the back here. I'm wondering about the um, difference between well, media outlets in the United States as opposed to media outlets here in the United States from overseas. And I'm thinking in particular about the BBC. And even just last week, there was a, um, the Belgian press conference that really pressed the ambassador from the United States to film uh, or vice versa. Film like it was related to the United States um, in Belgium. Um, and the Belgian press really pressed that particular politician for a particular question they were asking, and he kept trying to not answer it, and they kept at it. And I hear the same thing on the BBC, whereas the tactics in, that I hear in the American press is very much more like, okay, next question. So what is, I'm wondering if there's a philosophical difference, if it has to do with bias or not, or if there's a structural difference in perhaps how the papers are, are the media is funded in, in those settings, mm -hmm. if, if uh, my impressions, my impressions may be false about papers and media outlets in general over there. So um, with all of that, uh, all those caveats, I'm curious as to what you think. I think there is a fundamental difference between the types of news organizations, whether you're broadcast, whether you're radio, whether you're print, whether you're big print, medium print, little print. There are fundamental differences between all those organizations, how they gather news, what they're looking for. Um, broadcast journalists, when you look at a story, you're lucky if you can get two minutes of a report from a reporter. The New York Times may give that story a hundred inches if they think it's significant. Um, a medium paper may edit that story down if it comes from the wire service, which usually they will have to get it that way. Um, so how they approach that story is also going to be fundamentally different because Print reporters, I think, are a lot more dogged than broadcast reporters are. They're looking for a sound bite, a quick tip, something that titillates the audience when they present it. And maybe that's my bias in, in talking about broadcast, but I've been around them <laughs> enough to know that they're not doing, most of them are, I don't want to categorize them all the same way, but most of them are not doing the dirty work to get a story. And you'll notice 50% of the time CNN is reporting on what somebody else reported on, whether it's the New York Times or the Washington Post. But the dirty work has been done by those people who've developed the sources and asked the questions and confirmed all that information because they really don't have those resources in place to do it. And that's really important, whether you have the resources to keep digging and to keep going at something. I will also probably say that our politicians have gotten to be a lot more savvy. Everybody almost wants to handle the media nowadays. And that's really important to know that they want to handle you. Everybody down to even my level, you have to deal with the PR person. You have to deal with the PR person for the school system. If we want to go into the schools and take a picture, you have to run it through the PR millwork and, and see what comes out. Uh, the same thing with Richmond schools. So when you think, well, why can't we show this? Why can't you tell the story? Is because 
they're tr making it as difficult as possible for you not to get that information. It's normally they want the story told from their perspective in the way that they want to communicate with you, not the way that maybe that reporter wants to communicate with you. I'm going to go up here to this person first, and then we'll come back. Um, my question has to do with the responsibility of the public. Back in the pre-Civil War and the Civil War era, um, were there any writings that suggested that some of those Southern Democrats thought, well, maybe I'm not understanding the whole story? Whereas now we have so many different outlets, and we can see you know, there's the, the Trump people, and there's the anti-Trump people, and there's the same people. And, and we can pick and choose. Was that did the um, in the six in the eighteen sixties did the readers have a similar ability to find out other information? Readers in the South, for the most part, if you're not in Kentucky, no, you don't have the chance to find out alternative information. You can't do it. Uh, postmasters will refuse to deliver newspapers from the North to people who have subscriptions. They say these are abolitionist and, and inflammatory and we're not going to send them on. Uh, so you, could, you, you couldn't actually do it that way. But if you were in a state like Kentucky or Maryland, you probably were able to read newspapers from the other side of the Mason-Dixon line or the Ohio River. And the result is that there, the editors in places like Louisville and in places like Baltimore are much more able to say, well, it's not as simple as that. It's more complicated, which is basically one reason why in 1860-61, Maryland and Kentucky are just not keen on going into the Confederacy because their editors are saying, look, yeah, a dangerous Republican has been elected president. But we've got the House, we've got the Senate, we've got the Supreme Court, and the next set of elections is in two years. We're not in danger unless we follow those lunatics in <laughs> South Carolina. I mean, you know, any, any Kentucky editor, you know, in Louisville will tell you that, who was it? Is it I guess his name, I think it's Pettigrew. He's one of these South Carolinians who comes out of the secession convention in South Carolina and says he won't do. South Carolina is too small for a country and too big for an insane asylum. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a lot of people feel that way. Uh, so no, they, they, don't, they don't have any way of comparing. We today do. It, in many cases, it's just a matter of choice that we don't choose to, to read or see both. Uh, and that's, that, that's really the problem. I want, I want to caution the thing about this praise of, of, um, of uh, media in other countries. Probably one of the most dangerous occupations you can have in the world in an awful lot of other countries at this point is being a journalist because you get killed uh, uh, on a very regular basis. And in an awful lot of countries, the muzzle is on in terms of what you can say, including some places that are technically still claiming themselves to be democracy. Even in England, it has to be said, BBC is wonderful. But if you've ever read Rupert Murdoch's papers, or you've read The Sun with the naked lady on page three on a more quiet day as opposed to page one on one of its more lurid days, you realize that an awful lot of the newspapers there are doing a real junk job of, of, uh, of uh, giving people the news. Uh, the, the, uh, the responsibility, I think, of an awful lot of the tabloid press in England for the vote in favor of Brexit is really close and very clear uh, out there, where, where they're really distorting things with things that just were factually not true. Um, so I, I would caution that maybe we shouldn't look with real optimism abroad and say they do it so much better, because maybe with some exceptions, maybe they don't. Um, uh, running low on time, so I'd like to do a lightning round of these last couple of questions that I see. So we'll go here, here, and then Sarah, you've got the last question, but I'm going to ask our, our panelists to also keep your answers pretty brief so we mm -hmm. can get through these next questions pretty quickly. Um, print media. The importance of, I guess, copy editors, people that do the editing after things are written, uh, the positioning of photographs on pages, uh, what type of photographs are pictured, can be leading with the headlines in a political direction that maybe the article isn't. And I, I 
don't know how much of a problem that is. Uh, I'm a little older than probably most of y'all. And I've seen a lot of newspapers, and I've seen a lot of this over the years. And uh, the importance of copy editors is, I don't know whether you're like a Richmond paper, if that's an important position, or whether it's just somebody that puts some words together. I would say uh, briefly, um, I think that's the biggest danger is the way that headlines and photos so often are divergent from the, the stories. Uh, we, we don't do that at RBA Mag, but I think that's partially just an intention thing. A lot of people aren't reading articles. They're just scanning through Facebook or through whatever and just clicking like or share without reading. And I think media's had to kind of follow them, which is sad. I, I, I would say we push back on that, but a lot of places look at their livelihood disappearing if they don't if they don't chase yeah, that. Yeah, clicks mean money. Yeah, and that's what that's what a lot of people want to read. We've had, we've had a lot of success with long form, and so have others. I, the New Yorker is a great example of a place that's really revitalized itself with this great long form storytelling. I think there is a, a hunger for that out there, but I think it's also very attractive and kind of easy to chase the the quick money of the clickbait. Okay, we'll go to Chris. from the inside can you give for us to be more critical but confident navigators of the uh, media consumers today? Don't read anything that says slammed in the headline. <laughs> it's someone slammed someone. Just, just skip that one. That would be my big one. <laughs> you too? I, I would say develop a relationship with the people you know who are doing the work also. Every reporter has to have their contact information. It's their phone number, it's their email. Talk to them, let them know what you're thinking. If you see a bias or something in a story, I think they would appreciate hearing that. Um, they won't shy away from that because I, I think we're used to being you know, critical of each other's work. So that's a part of the process. And I think the media takes a lot of heat, or I guess the lamestream media <laughs> takes a lot of heat. And um, I think it's important for the reading and listening public to know that a lot of us are in this because we care. And I think this has already been said, but it's, it, it's a labor of love in a lot of ways. Like, you know, I got into this because I wanted to um, tell stories that were not being told from a small community nobody's ever heard of um, where I'm from and you know I dedicated a lot of my schooling to learning how to best do this and um, everybody I know in this industry is the same way they're they're dedicated to it and so I think that's important for the public to know Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.